Well, it's a delight to come and worship with you all today. I'm obviously not Greg McDaniel. My hair's a little darker. <laughs> He's still here, though. He was going to be out of town, um, but things fell through. And instead, I was already planning on being here, so we'll just keep going as we were planning, right? So I just invite you guys now, as we do always in our service, to approach our God together in prayer, come to his throne and ask for his help with this morning and all the other things that we have come on our way each and every week. Will you pray with me? Father God, we join together with the psalmist this morning in Psalm 67 in saying, let the peoples praise you. Oh God, let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the people with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Lord God, we worship you this morning and give you thanks for the countless ways that you have been gracious to us. You've provided us with daily bread. You've given us homes and apartments to live in. You've given us jobs to work, neighbors to love. You've blessed us with wives, husbands, sons and daughters, even grandchildren. And most of all, we thank you for Christ. We praise you, O God, for revealing your eternal might, love, kindness, grace, and mercy to us sinners through the mystery of Christ and Him crucified. And with the apostles, we, we do not want to marvel that we've been even given authority over the power of the enemy and that nothing can ultimately hurt us in Christ, but we rejoice that our names are written in heaven. You've adopted us and placed us in your church with these fellow saints here who delight and exalt you and want to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we admit that we too often have the tendency to, to not treasure up these things as we should, and rather than see them as the gifts that they are, that you graciously provided for us. Instead, our affections get disordered. Instead of increasing our joy, we make idols out of these things that should, should point us to you. Father, forgive us for loving the world and the things of the world more than we love you. Our minds are too frequently set on things below rather than things that are above where Christ is seated on high with you, Father. Forgive us for believing the lie that there is this secular sacred divide. We confess that our lives are both physical and spiritual together. We are embodied souls that are constantly in need of your sustaining grace lest we perish. And just drive from us all the pride and arrogance that we bring into our relationships, into our vocations, even into our recreation and our, the things that we contemplate about. It is in weeks like this past week when many of us are made to think about our own frailty and humanity. Father, we grieve over the deaths of two of your servants um, that have recently come home to you, Lord. And I know that not everyone in here knows about these people, but God, I thank you for the faithful ministries, the teaching, the influence of a fellow pastor, Harry Reader in Alabama, and a more well-known one, Pastor Tim Keller in New York. Although both of these brothers did not minister week in and week out to our congregation, like our brother Greg and the other elders here do in Cincinnati, Many of us have been greatly influenced by the way you spoke through them. Not everything they said, but a lot of what they said throughout decades of teaching and training and sermons, both in person and from afar. And Lord, I just, I'm personally grateful for Keller's writings on the gospel and marriage. My relationship with you and with Lindy would not be the same without his works. I just pray that you help each of us to never forget the ancient truth that he once wrote, that we're more sinful and flawed than ourselves than we ever dared believe, and yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. God, we're grateful for these people this morning that are from our church, that we have 
connected with our church that are doing things to the ends of the earth that have been commissioned to take the gospel to other nations. We lift up David and Alyssa Whistle. We praise you and thank you for the safe delivery of their firstborn little girl, Heidi Elizabeth. We thank you for working through that entire process, Lord God, bringing that little one home. We thank you for the blessing of David being able to skip some time and jump forward in language school and not have to go back and learn a lot of things over again. We pray that you bless them, help them to, as they wave, that go through all of the culture shocks that are going to hit them as they grieve leaving home and get used to life there. We pray for our brothers and sisters and friends of Christ Church in Uganda who we got to see a couple weeks ago. We pray that the recent work they've been doing with the teenagers and college students in Gayaza is bearing much fruit. We already I report that there have been eight baptisms. We celebrate the changed lives there of our sisters and brothers in Africa. And God, I pray for Seth and Rebecca Malley in Togo. They have a number of needs. I pray it seems so trivial, but when you're in the, uh, the bush and different difficult places. We just pray that their vehicles would continue to function well, that their health would be strong, that, that they can raise the funds for the church building that they want to build in the village of Yipka, and that they would love and disciple their children well. We pray that same thing for Friedrich and Mary Ellen, our brother and sister in Leipzig, Germany, that they would raise their children in the nurture and admonition of you, Lord God, and for their church gatherings that ironically right now are being held in a local pub garden during the hours that it's open. And it's outside and it provides these amazing opportunities to meet unbelievers and have them listen in whether they like it or not while they're drinking. But God, it also leaves a lot of uncertainty with the weather. And so we just pray that you would keep the rain from falling on Sunday morning so that they can gather and worship in that place. And then I pray for those in our church who you may be pricking their hearts today or months before or even after this sermon this morning that are discerning a call to go overseas themselves. May you cultivate, enrich, encourage, and strengthen them as they consider such a big move. Father, we're thankful for these saints that continue to sow the seeds of your kingdom in the midst of joys and struggles and tears. And may your spirit empower us to not only support them well, but also to be encouraged and challenged by their lives to be witnesses here in our city. May we see that example and do the same thing here. And God, now as we approach your word this morning, will you grant us the ability to hear its faithful testimony be transformed by its eternal truth. We pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, we're going to jump away from the book of Romans for a brief week to look at what the Lord has to say to us in the first chapter of Acts. Um, To look at something called the Great Commission, but we're going to look at Luke's version of it at the beginning of the early church. So I invite you guys to hear the word of the Lord, and then we'll dive in together. This morning's passage is from uh, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, Two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Would you pray with me? Eternal Father, 
you have spoken in various times and in various ways through your prophets in the past. But in these last days, you have spoken in your son, the incarnate word. We pray that you will open the mouth of your servant, Travis, to proclaim that very word in the power of the Holy Spirit. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of the word. And we pray that this same spirit will open our hearts to receive your holy gospel and that you would write your law on our hearts just as you have promised to do so. We ask this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John. <clears throat> have you ever wondered just what is, what is the Lord doing? Like, what, what is he doing? doing what could possibly be going on in this world this story that he's writing with this entire universe and i'm not just saying in your own life family community and nation those are some really interesting narratives right but also the world there are 270 plus nations outside of america and i know we look around here and we see troublesome things and I'm going to list some things off, and please don't get too anxious, but you see them every day anyways. Inflation, the threat of the dollar failing, an impending recession, the erosion of Western civilization and morality, a war going on in another country that we're seemingly involved in. And these are just the things that our media outlets really like to talk about all the time, right? Right? But if you ever look at BBC and Al Jazeera, which is a news outlet from Doha, Qatar, they'll inform you of a whole host of different trials and tribulations and wars in countries that many of us rarely think about. Some of these countries, you might not even know they exist. You don't know how to pronounce them. There's unrest in Pakistan, tribal fighting in Nigeria, a cyclone just hit Mozambique. The only time I've heard about a cyclone in America is the Iowa State mascot. And there's not cyclones in Iowa, right? Uh, ongoing conflict in Sudan, a presidential election in Turkey that's been rather tumultuous. Many of us rarely think about how God is working in these foreign nations where it's sometimes illegal to share the gospel. And I know things aren't like they used to be here, but you can still share the gospel with most people and not get in trouble. And I know some of you work in places where that's becoming less and less the case. But overall, we have tremendous freedoms. We don't consider these other continents, cities, villages inhabited by billions of people that bear God's image or the churches that God's planted there under severe persecution. Because we've got so much going on here, right? Who's got time to think about them? I got my own family, my own job, my own church. My own nation. I'm reminded of a story that pastor and theologian John Stott once shared about this visit that he made to a church one evening. He writes this, I remember some years ago visiting a church incognito. I sat in the back row, and he said, I wonder who's in the back row tonight, because they, they're the ones that always want to slip in their incognito. So I actually, I think, I know, I know all of you in the back row. T- so <laughs> he says, I'm, and I'm not going to tell you the church's name, But when they came to the pastoral prayer, it was led by a lay brother because the pastor was on holiday, sort of like this morning. Um, So he prayed that the pastor might have a good holiday, and he said, well, that's fine. Pastors should have good holidays, right? We don't want our pastors to go away and have like the worst vacation ever and come back not refreshed. And he said, second, he prayed for a lady member of the church who was about to give birth to a child that she might have a safe delivery, which is fine, and we're thankful for you that just had a safe delivery with your own children. Third, he prayed for another lady who was sick, and then it was over, which is certainly a good thing to do. And he said, though, that that's all there was. It took 20 seconds. And Stott said to himself, this is a village church with a village God. They have no interest in the world outside, There is no thinking about the poor, the oppressed, the refugees, the places of violence, or world evangelization. 
Now, to be fair, for all that guy Stott knew, this substitute preacher, lay brother, he, he may have been a godly, outspoken witness that prays every single morning for the nations, and maybe he just just doesn't like being in front of the church, and that's all he could get out, right? Let's show some little benefit of doubt, some grace to this fellow. But I think the point still comes through. Because unless our jobs or school force us to interact with people from around the world, or we're super intentional in our like news diet to have it include international events, we tend to forget that our God is a global God. But we do not serve a village God. Amen? We don't serve a village God that will one day be defeated by some stronger neighboring village God, neighboring national God. No, we worship and serve the living God who reigns over the entire earth across every nation and every single generation. He is God. He is king. Not over just here, but everywhere. And he is to be worshipped. And right now there are Christians around the world who are willing to bear witness to that global God, to Christ Jesus at a great cost, And these believers are so resolute in their convictions and trusting in the gospel that even with the threat of being beaten or losing their lives, they still proclaim the resurrection because they know that if you kill them, you can't keep them down. They're going to rise from the dead one day in victory. And even though they might lose their jobs or be disowned by their parents and families for holding to this faith once for all delivered to the saints, they still open their mouths because... They know that they've been adopted by God, their eternal father, into this eternal family who has these brothers and sisters that will hold them up even while they're down, even when the income isn't there. We have stuff like love and deed in our church that cares for our people when they have a hardship that comes their way. The church supports those even in their greatest trials And this morning, I want you to consider how the witness of the gospel moved its way out from Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and made its way across several nations and centuries. And eventually, guys, it was translated. It wasn't originally in English. It was translated and then communicated to you so that you would be saved and transformed by Christ Jesus and the gospel. And as a believer today... That wasn't something that they just did, and you guys just to be, get to just be consumers of that product. No, you are called to be a witness to Christ. Wherever he places you, wherever he's going to call you, you get the duty and delight to bear witness to Jesus. And this is the mission of God that you're invited to participate in. And with this aim in mind, I want to show you three things from our text this morning. The purpose of your witness, the power behind your witness, and what Christ promises to all of his witnesses. The purpose, the power, and the promise. That's easy to remember, right? All the P's. I'm a Baptist, so that just sort of happens. So first, what is the purpose of witness? Let's look back at our text, Acts 1, 6 through 7. It says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. So we start there. The disciples were curious about what's going on. When is Jesus going to restore the kingdom to Israel? When will God's people no longer be under persecution? And the ethics of these pagans be promoted as like the morality of the world that they live in. When would they get the land back? And at the time, you know, the Romans were in control. They did not worship God. And likewise, they had the Old Testament and had all these promises about this very thing happening sometime in the future. Them getting this restoration of Israel. So it, let's not be too hard on them either. This question was legitimate. This desire was worthy. This is why Jesus does not deny that the kingdom will be restored. He doesn't say that's a dumb question. Why are you asking dumb questions all the time? 
man, I rose from the dead. Can we stop with the dumb question? No, he says, he, he turns it and changes the discussion. He says that this, it's, it's going to happen sometime, but not in the manner that the disciples thought. Jesus tells the disciples that they do not need to know the timing of his kingdom being totally established on earth. Instead of giving him, them that information about the future times and seasons of God's plan, Christ calls us, called them and us, to be his witnesses in the times and seasons he's placed us now. This does not mean that you should be naive about where you are located in history, in the culture around you, what it teaches and preaches and proclaims, you should gain a basic knowledge of those things. But that's in order for you to be effective, an effective witness to the people in your life. We need to be like the sons of Issachar in First Chronicles 12. It says that they were men of understanding. They understood the times, how Israel should act. They had a pulse on the culture. And it informed what they did, what they said. As Jesus says, the Father has all authority. He's fixed the times and seasons by his authority. But we should not obsess over the times and allow them to change our message. Instead, we tell that old, old story about how the Savior came in glory and he came and he saved wretches like you and me. So when we see ad campaigns about how Jesus is just like us or how he gets us, we should ask ourselves, about whom is this actually bearing witness? Is it bearing witness about the whims and opinions of today? About the mass of people? Or is it bearing witness to Christ and Him crucified? Let's continue. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. So here's the big point. God gives us his Holy Spirit so that we will be witnesses of Jesus Christ. We will be witnesses. Can I get a witness? Jesus asked. He's like, all right, I'm going to make some witnesses out of you all. But what is a witness? What does a witness do? What does that word even mean? Well, witness testifies, and they should be testifying to the truth. The word used here for witness is martus. It's typically used of one who testifies in legal matters, for one who affirms or attests to something. And many of you might recognize that word because it sounds like martyr, and that's where we get that word from. It comes from that Greek word. But, you know, when we use martyr, it usually means that someone's outspoken or they have these convictions or these beliefs that kind of run roughshod over the prevailing opinion and they can either get canceled, persecuted, or even killed because they believe that, and they are then considered a martyr for that. And so we see this word here, a witness. A witness believes in something. He is convinced that something is true, and he unashamedly tells people about it. He doesn't hold back. And especially in a court of law, an attorney will often call witnesses, right, to testify to a certain aspect of a case. And these testimonies either validate or repudiate the charge leveraged against the defendant. You may recall the ninth commandment states in Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And many times we may try to summarize this into the more simplistic, you shall not lie. Don't lie. And that's true, right? We start with our kids. Tell me the truth. Don't lie. And if they do, we got we to nip that in the bud early because we don't want them to be just these neurotic just deceivers that keep going on and on and on and don't tell the truth. But there's more here. In fact, a lot of these commandments, they kind of put the, the worst of the worst thing at the top. And like the old confessions, like the Westminster and Heidelberg, they explain and they extrapolate and exposit this command and, and, and explain that there's more here. So like the worst in not telling the truth would be to bear false witness in a court of law when someone's life could be destroyed on account of your deceit. Deuteronomy 17.6 says, On the evidence of two witnesses or of three witnesses, the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. 
You see, in biblical times, the technologies of audio, video, recordings, fingerprints, doing DNA, all that testing, that didn't exist. So a testimony of two or three people, it was crucial, it was necessary evidence during a trial. However, there were still injustices that took place. There were still times where people used this idea of witnesses to go ahead and do something wicked. 1 Kings 21, we read about probably the most egregious example of a story of a man named Naboth. King Ahab, he was the tyrant king of Israel, really wanted to take possession of Naboth's vineyard. But Naboth didn't want to give up his property. He wanted to keep his land and the business in his family. And this made Ahab sad, sad king. I can't just take what I want. So he moped around in his palace spent extra time sulking in his bed and refused to eat anything until his wife, Jezebel, don't, don't name your children Jezebel. Um, <laughs> I've only heard of dogs named Jezebel. Um, wife named Jezebel told him to stop it because she had a plan to take the vineyard back. And in verse 13, we find what her diabolical strategy was. She was going to get, it says it in the Bible, two worthless men to position themselves across from Naboth at a meal and to fabricate a charge against him saying, Naboth, curse God and the king. And then the result was that these two witnesses of these worthless men, they then, <laughs> they, uh, that was their trial right there. They used that and the people took Naboth outside the city and they stoned him to death. And Jezebel's like, hey, Ahab, you know, happy birthday. Here's the vineyard. We see a wicked king using the biblical idea of providing witnesses, not to pursue justice, but to get his heart, what his heart coveted. And the idea of justice is actually used to promote injustice. But this shouldn't surprise us, for us who believe the gospel. Because this same sin of rallying up a bunch of witnesses and bearing false testimony was committed against God himself. The ruling religious elites of the time slandered the character of Jesus to the point that he was falsely accused of wrongdoing and sentenced to death on a cross. He was perfect, never sinned once, and yet out of their bitter envy, the religious leaders claimed that he incited riots, that he blasphemed, they said he was a glutton, that he was a drunkard, all of these things, which we know it's not true, not true at all. In John 18.33, we read, So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. And what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. No, my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you're a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king, but listen to this. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. Of course, this wasn't the answer that the Jewish leaders wanted, right? That's not what the crowd wanted to hear. They'd already been posting their verdict online. They've already decided what exactly is true, and they've reposted it and shared it and shared it and over. And so we already know, no, Jesus is guilty. This is the only way justice can happen. He must be crucified. <laughs> Thus they rallied all the voices had them yell as loud as they could so that the perfect son of glory would be crucified. And the revolutionary, the murderer, who had already been convicted, they've already said, yes, you are that, he was let go. Rather than pursuing truth and righteousness, Pilate chose the opinion of the mob to avoid any further conflict because he wasn't worried about the truth. He had to maintain the status quo. The culture around him was more important than what aligned with reality. He was a coward. And you see, a wicked witness lies for greedy gain and to save face with the people he fears. A righteous witness holds fast to the truth and possesses integrity and proclaims the way things really are 
And as Jesus told Pilate, he came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth listens to his voice. So whose witnesses are we supposed to be? Jesus says, my witnesses. Church, you are Christ's witnesses. You are both called and given the promise that you will be those who testify to the truth of the gospel. In the middle of this high priestly prayer, John Um, Jesus said in John 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them. Jesus is the faithful witness to the truth. He is truth itself, and he sets us apart by his word, the truth, and sends us out with that word. What's the content of our testimony? To what exactly do we bear witness about regarding Jesus Christ? Luke 24 tells us. And Luke is like, Volume one of a two-volume set with Luke and Acts. Luke wrote both of those volumes. And so this is what he says before he finishes volume one. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance For the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are my witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. We are witnesses to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we do this through the preaching of the gospel. We recited that and sang that this morning during our songs. And that's what it is. That's the content. That's what we share about Jesus. And all of the scriptures bear witness to Christ. And this is easier to see in the New Testament, right? But the Old Testament, that's at the heart of it. And Jesus tells us the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are about him. And God's kindly given us that special revelation about him. And, and we, we hold that in our hands this morning. It's been translated so that we have it and we can read it. But the gospel of Christ is what we bear witness to. In fact, this truth is not just contained in your Bibles, guys, but the whole universe bears witness and points to this. During his triumphal entry into Jerusalem before his crucifixion, Jesus' disciples were shouting out, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Then what happened? Well, the Pharisees were like, Hey, that's not right. Tell them to be quiet. And rebuke your followers for saying such things. And how did Jesus respond? He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The very stones would cry out. Even the rocks bear witness to the reality that Christ is Lord. All creation proclaims that Christ is Lord. And we know this because we've already gone through Romans 1. And Greg preached to us, That creation does this. The natural world shows God's eternal power and divine nature. And you can't silence the truth that the entire cosmos was created by. On what everything finds its foundation on. Yet people in their sin and unrighteousness, they want to put their fingers in their ears and cover their eyes from the truth and beauty and goodness of all that God has revealed. The rocks will testify to Christ. Even when you won't open your mouth. So, question, you you don't want to be dumber than a rock, do you? (laughs) You don't want to be dumber than a rock. If you're a Christian, you don't want to be dumber than a rock. We can't let the rocks and the rest of creation have all the fun in proclaiming the truth. And now I know many of you do that. You share it. You bear witness to the truth. You share the gospel over and over to your friends and your family, your neighbors, but they still don't believe. They still suppress the truth and live by their own carefully constructed lies and this is because as theologian Herman Bobbink once wrote we cannot credit a knowledge of God to ourselves to our own discovery investigation or reflection if it were not given us by an act of free and unobliged favor there would be no possibility that we could ever achieve it by an exertion of our own wills we have to remember that the knowledge of God both special revelation in the scriptures and general revelation of the natural world and creation can only be rightly perceived and believed by God's grace, his common grace. And we see that today. People don't understand 
the human body. People don't understand the way the world works. They can't see it. They've been blinded. And the same is true of our gospel witness, which brings us to our second point of our passage, the sovereign power behind your witness. So what is the power behind your witness? Let's look back at our text. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In Acts 2, you can read about Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit's poured out upon the church. And this event, has a huge, it's a huge watershed moment in the history of the church. In the Old Testament, God's presence was with his people. And it was the power, pillar of cloud and fire. And then, then you have the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle and the temple. But now the Holy Spirit has been given to the church and it indwells her as the temple made of living stones. Jesus left so that he could send the Holy Spirit to us and he says that it's actually to our advantage that he left. Because the Spirit convicts the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment and guides us in all truth and it glorifies Christ. In Acts, the giving of the Holy Spirit, it's tied to the mission of making disciples throughout the world. And this is what the Holy Spirit does. It confirms and emboldens your witness to the kingdom of God. So first, it, the Holy Spirit confirms the witness. So how, how can you bear witness to something you haven't seen? How do you know something is true when you weren't there? Well, today you might, you know, oh, we have all these smartphones, right? You can take a video, and uh, you can share that video. You take a picture, but... You know that there's software out there now that you can doctor something up and make it communicate and show something very different than what actually happened. In fact, have you ever heard of something called a deep fake? A deep fake? These AI generated videos that, man, it looks really similar. I mean, one, one of the ones I remember the most was there's this one that was doctored up and it slowed down. Um, and this one it wasn't even like a really intense deep fake. But it had a politician talking in a way that made it sound like she was drunk. She wasn't actually drunk. But of course, the opposing side jumped on that and said, look, she's drunk. And just went all and just foaming it at the mouth and said, look, she's not fit to lead our country. And the reality was, though, if you want to make that argument, you can't make it based on that video. Because the video was false. It didn't have reality to it. It didn't actually bear witness to the truth. And some of these videos are so hard to notice that they're wrong, that they've been doctored up, because this technology has gotten really advanced. So the credibility of the witness, as well as a multitude of witnesses, certainly helps. And the evidence of the case is either strong or found wanting based on these two criteria. The apostles were those who really witnessed the ministry of Jesus, his crucifixion and interacted with him after he rose from the dead. And they saw him with their own two eyes. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, that Christ appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, and though some have fallen asleep. So over 500 people at the time could testify to the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. But it's interesting to read what Jesus says to one of these witnesses named Thomas, who initially doubted. He demanded physical evidence before he believed. In John 20, he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. How could it be a blessing not to see Jesus? If you, you, know, you ever get to ask that question as a child? If you could go back in time and meet one person, who would you go meet? Everybody's like, Jesus. Like, I'm gonna go, or, you know, maybe uh, Teddy Roosevelt or some, I don't know, some other person. But usually, if you're a Christian, you always have to say, Jesus, right? I want to go back and see him. I want to go talk to him. Wouldn't it have been more blessed to hear Jesus preach, to talk with him, to observe the miracles he performed, to touch his hands and his side? Jesus is apparently is saying no. Because in Romans 10, as John prayed, faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Because the Holy Spirit was there when Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, he helped make it happen. 
when you hear the words of a faithful witness like God himself in the spirit to a historical event, that's sufficient grounds for knowing that it actually happened. Many of the things we believe about history are no longer empirically verifiable, but we trust the eyewitnesses. I grew up in Virginia. I could go see all the Civil War and the Revolutionary War stuff, but if I wanted to get really scientific, be like, man, I don't really know if it happened. Like, no, like, I can see the places where it happened, and then people have told and written it down, and I, and I trust that more or less we have the right account of what happened. And you don't, if you don't have a trust in these historical events through these testimonies it'll forever keep you in the dark of what happened before and it will probably set you up for failing in the same ways in the future let me explain how this relates to the holy spirit with an illustration how many of you remember that classic toy a light bright see and if you're older or younger rather it was i think they showed it in stranger things right so they were like yeah the 80s But, like, I was more of a child of the 90s, and I played with it. Um, It's a toy that was originally marketed in 1967, and it consisted of this light box, right, with these colored plastic pegs that you could put into this panel, and they would illuminate and create this picture. And you can get really creative with it, or there were templates that you could put on it, and and then look, it's a duck, or a car, or an airplane. All of these different things. You see, all of creation and providence, history, reveals God's glory to mankind. So every sun, moon, star, rock, blade of grass, mountain peak, sea, as well as every single animal, bird, fish, it's like a plastic peg placed in that panel of God's light bright, which is his revelation to the world about himself. Every marriage, parent, child, every person that bears his image shows something about God, his character, his plan of salvation. All those major events that you read in the Bible, Noah's Ark, the Exodus, manna in the wilderness, the law of Moses, the tabernacle, the temple, David taking down Goliath, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, their pegs in the light bright. And then, of course, Jesus comes, and you start to see more of the picture coming around, but he adds some plagues to give more greater definition through his signs, his preaching, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And then now, even today, every time the word of God is read, preached, taught, sung, shared, and every time the church baptizes a member of this covenant community, and we take the Lord's Supper, these are all things designed and ordained by God to show the glory of Christ to us weak and frail men and women. But here's the thing. Every light bright requires a light. Every light bright requires illumination behind its panel. Otherwise, the colorful pegs don't shine. They don't glow. You don't see the brilliance of it. And that is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is the light. It's the electricity. It's the power plugged into the wall that... It, it shines the glory of God to us who cannot see. It helps us to see and believe, to be blessed by the beauty of Christ our King today through the Scriptures. The Holy Spirit helps us to see things like marriage. It's the mystery of Christ and the church. It helps us, as Joe Rigney has said, when we see a little child reaching up for their father, it's like, us reaching up to God, our Father. The Holy Ghost enables us when we see another person bearing the image of God, we see a little something about our eternal God. And the Spirit even enables us to hear the rocks cry out and give glory to God in the highest. This is what the Spirit of God does. It turns on the lights. It removes the blindfold of the devil's lies and lets us see the world as it truly is. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18 talks about this. But when the one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is, a, who is the spirit. 
the Holy Spirit takes us out of darkness and gives us light. We once weren't able to see God, and now we can. This is what it does. But here's the thing. Those that live in darkness, one of the hardest things in talking to those that live in darkness is that they hate light. They hate the truth. They hate it when it shines and convicts on their hearts. And so that's why being a witness can be dangerous. The unbelieving world, it it hates Jesus. And if they hate Jesus, they will hate you. Which brings me to the next thing that the Spirit does. It emboldens your witness. It gives you power, boldness to do that. You know what was the most repeated prayer in the book of Acts by the early church? It was for boldness. After Peter and John were released from serving time in prison for preaching Christ, they met up with the rest of the believers and they prayed. They prayed this prayer in Acts 4. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servant to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed to the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. The filling of the Holy Spirit is connected with the boldness to speak the word of God in the midst of a culture that is hostile to it. It's hostile because the truth is that sinful man wants to bear witness to himself. doesn't want to bear witness to God. It wants to tell you all about how wonderful and godlike they are, how you are, not God himself. A sinner prefers to have others glory in their accomplishments and opinions and identities instead of their creator. And in our flesh, the temptation is there to routinely just Bear witness to everything but God because we know the world hates him. For the past few decades, there's a hotly debated thing within uh, the missions world, something called insider movements. Um, This is primarily in countries where um, there are Muslims, but it has happened in Hindu uh, countries, and I, I like to argue that we have the temptation of having it happen here. And what these people do is they say, okay, well, what, what is the minimal um, gospel message that we need to get to these people? And they dumb it down to the point where they contextualize it, and all that's left is, I mean, it, some of these insider movement churches in Muslim countries, you have, you have people that claim that they're still Muslims, but they believe Jesus, and they go to mosques, And they're like, I don't pray to Allah anymore. I actually pray to Jesus. But they never they never say anything or do anything that shows that they're different than the community around them. It's this private sort of me and Jesus are cool and Allah is, you know, he's just a friend. And what's so heinous about that idea, and I know these people mean well and they want to be able to be relevant and reach these folks and it the hostility is great in those countries where it it's illegal to be a christian I, sharing the gospel proselytizing there are laws on the books that say you are breaking the law if you're found doing it you'll go to jail and and the, their parents will out them their brothers and sisters will take it to the police because they're so focused I'm maintaining that. We have to realize that that same temptation arises here. When you believe in a privatized faith, one that doesn't bear witness to Jesus, and you keep it to yourself, and, and you believe the lie from the world telling you, hey, just keep Jesus to yourself, the same sort of insider movement is going to happen here. There's not going to be any change. There's not going to be any bold witness. And here's the thing. They'll say that, but everybody else is preaching. Everybody else is bearing witness to something, to morality, to truth, to some other gospel. They have their own blasphemy laws. Will you bear witness to Christ even when it is difficult, even when you have hostility coming your way? As God once told Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. 
Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you. We can take courage in teaching the pure gospel because Christ is with us wherever we go. And the great commission he gives us, he also promises us that his abiding presence will be there forever with the gift of the Holy Spirit. But that's not the only thing he promises. He gives his witnesses two other things. And that's the final point. We'll roll through it really quickly. What is promised to his witnesses? The first thing, the church will bear witness to the entire world that Christ is Lord. The church will do this. It's not going to be a failure. It's going to happen. Look at Acts 1.8, one more time. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We do not bear witness to a village God, or a national God, or a western God of white people. We bear witness to an international, holy, righteous, loving God that sits over the entire universe. He's God, and he's changed the lives of Jews, Gentiles, rich, poor, small, and great. He shows no favoritism, nor promotes partiality. As Habakkuk 2.14 says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And likewise, in Isaiah 49.6, which Luke is quoting here, he says, it is, too, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved in Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. The nations will hear and will believe the gospel and the church witness is a global movement that cannot be stopped. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And this is the movement that you see in the book of Acts. It's almost like a table of contents. Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 7. Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 through 12. The ends of the earth, 13 through 28. Some people would say that Rome, where Paul ends up preaching to Caesar, when he gets there at the end, that's the ends of the earth. And we don't have to debate that, but we know, we know, think about this, how much this promise has already been fulfilled. You and I are in Cincinnati, Ohio. You know how far that is from Jerusalem? I looked it up. 6,197 miles away from Jerusalem. Our lives have been changed by the gospel of Christ that made its way from a motley band of disciples who were terrified out of their minds after their king supposedly died but rose from the dead and it's made its way out to us. This room is full of more Christians than it started right after Jesus rose from the dead. And there's multiple evidences of that in our nation and nations around the world. Our lives have been changed by the gospel of Christ because of people faithfully witnessing over the generations. So how do we apply this verse today? Well, first, witness where you are. It started in Jerusalem. That's where a lot of these people live. This is their home. That was their heritage. That was their, their nation. That's where they could, you know, look on the books and see family's been here for, for centuries. Start here. Start at home. Start in your township. Ladies, you have a chance to really drill into this soon with missional motherhood. Think about that deeply. How are you going to be on mission, mothering, being intentional, nurturing, not just for the sake of nurturing, but nurturing towards Christ. Our children are put in our homes. They're our little ones, and yet they're a little mission field too. Romans 10, how will they hear unless someone goes to them? Guess what, mom and dad? You have been appointed to go to them. You get to be the missionary to them. And I know at the end of that passage, Paul quotes Deuteronomy and says, all day long I hold up my hands to this disobedient generation. I feel like that's going to be the case often. But you have the delightful privilege to share the good news of the gospel to your children. Step out of your comfort zone and talk to your coworkers about Jesus. Ask them what they did this past weekend, and then hopefully, you know, you can, they can ask you. Maybe you have a good enough relationship, and you can share with them that you went to church, and then tell them about how you worship Jesus. Then you can even level up and invite them home to your house. That'll get uncomfortable quick. 
especially if you've got a bunch of Bibles or books laying out, you're talking about those. Maybe you work in the trades, and you get to go in people's houses all the time. HVAC, electrician, you have a chance to walk into their house. That's a holy appointment. Pray. Ask God's blessing on that home. Ask for God to open it up to the gospel. Who knows what will happen over time? I don't know how many times I share the gospel or talk to the like HVAC guy that's tried to come to my house or something. It just naturally, if I'm there, you can make it happen. Whatever job you're doing, get creative. Think about it. Taking care of dogs, teaching them how to not act the fool and be crazy. You can pray for those people that come in. God bless them. If the opportunity arises, you share the gospel with them. Witness where you are. Pray for three things. Your nation, the nations, and every generation. So next time, before you feel that temptation to complain about everything that's going wrong in our nation, there's a lot of it, pray. Ask God to work in the hearts, bring restoration and revival. Because most of you can't do anything about what's going on in D.C. unless you want to run for office, which that seems like an awful career path, but <laughs> if you do, we'll support you and love you, pray for you a lot, but otherwise, you pray now, you pray here, you know that the God of the universe directs the hearts of the kings. The nations, there are prayer cards out there, grab them up, pick them up, take them home, put them on your refrigerator, Make it a regular thing. Our family, on the way to church every single Sunday morning, we pray for you guys. We pray for Pastor Greg. We pray for the Grace Kids servants. And we pray for our missionaries. Embed those rhythms into your life. Doesn't have to be on the way to church. Find something. Grab a hold of it. Get creative and do it. Every generation, pray for your children. Pray for the children of this church and our city. Because the reached can become the unreached in a generation. It's that easy. Lastly, learn about what the Lord has done and is doing around the world. Read church history. Pick up a missionary biography. Take a look. I got a recommended resource list out there posted by our missions table. Go look at that. Start looking at it and learn more. Get educated. Learn about what's going on. And then pray. Pray. And maybe, maybe God might call you to go. I'm not going to try and, we're not, we can't send everybody out. We wouldn't have the infrastructure to do that. But, but man, if you want to go, you let the elders know and we will pray. We will prepare to send you out well and to care for you. The last promise we clearly see in this text, Jesus will come again. He'll come again. Acts 1, 9 through 11. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go. And you, you could spend just a sermon on this, the ascension. We don't have time for that today. We already proclaimed it during the catechism question during the service. Jesus Christ, the resurrected God-man, right now is sitting on his throne in heaven, ruling and reigning over the universe, pleading our cause in the presence of his Father. He's witnessing to his righteousness that clothes us through his blood. We're not supposed to be looking up into the sky, neglecting the work that he gives us. Christ did not send the Holy Spirit to empower you to sit around and watch Netflix and consume Cheetos and watch the clouds go by. He calls you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them everything Jesus taught. Yes, we should say, come Lord Jesus. We should say that. But we pray that prayer and then continue on his mission. Calling folks to repent and believe the gospel, to kiss the sun lest they perish. Nevertheless, we know that when we face hardships and trials for being Christians, we have that blessed hope that Jesus will come back and he will make it right.
he will judge the living and the dead. He will execute perfect righteousness. He will eradicate all wickedness. And he will take hold of his bride, who he has made ready. He's clothed in fine linen and pure and bright. He has guaranteed this from his very mouth. Last Saturday, a lot of us had the privilege to attend the wedding vow renewal ceremony of Byron and Diana Black. They've been married for 40 years. You can clap for that. That's, um, that's longer than I've been alive. Uh, <laughs> but the whole event was a wonderful thing to witness because the way that they structured the ceremony and spoke about their covenant relationship with one another. It pictured the gospel in a brilliant way. Just the way God designed marriage to do. That's what it was made for. They made it clear to everyone that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he adores his bride, the church, and that he will never let her go. And at the end of the ceremony, we sang the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I know my wife said I always end with a song, so here we go. It wouldn't be a sermon unless I did it. Um, And these lyrics, they stuck out in a fresh way. Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to their great faithfulness, mercy, and love. The heavens declare the glory of God. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can have confidence and boldness to bear witness just like nature. Manifold witness to that great faithfulness, mercy, and love that Christ is king in your homes, in your neighborhoods, in your workplaces, in this nation, and to the ends of the earth, all the while looking forward to his glory supreme. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for being so faithful. Great is your faithfulness, Lord Jesus, to us. We thank you that you've given us this commission, this call to be witnesses to your resurrection, to your crucifixion, to this gospel. We pray that you would help our weak and frail hearts who are often fearful from telling someone and having them give us backlash, Lord God. May you help us to be faithful, to share the good news of the gospel with our kids, with our friends, with our family, maybe with our spouses, with our neighborhoods, and even, Lord God, take us to the nations so that your name may be magnified in all the earth. We pray that you help us do this because you promised you would. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand?